As a researcher, your online presence is an important aspect of your career in academia. In this video, I cover four points that I think everybody should consider and we're starting right now. The first is get an ORCID. An ORCID is an Open Researcher and Contributor ID. And it has very many advantages. And I think if you don't have one, then stop this video and get an ORC ID or do it after you watched it to the end. The ORCID is a standard identifier that is unique to an author, basically sticks with you through your entire career and therefore is very useful to have. To create an ORCID, you just go to the ORCID website as a nonprofit. I link to that site in the description below and then you create your 16 digit unique ORCID identifier. It's free. One of the reasons um, that you may not have realized that an ORCID is useful is that many times in um, online submission systems, for example, for journal articles, people ask for uh, the, the, the online submission system basically asks for your ORCID. And so you can also log on through your ORCID. I've increasingly done that because it's hard to keep track of all the different logins, for example, for the different manuscripts. So you can very often just log on to a manuscript submission system with your ORCID. Also, some publishers and journals require you to have an ORCID, for example, if you're the corresponding author. So then it's also good to have it already. Many people list the ORCID on their CD because it's an easy link to provide uh, that lists of also all your papers, which is, for example, good if you don't have your own website. But it's especially important to have an ORCID if, for example, your name changes or if there are different versions of your name or common misspellings of your name. For example, if you have unusual letters in your name, like an umlaut in German, ä, ö, ö, or something like this, or if sometimes your name is published with a middle initial, like mine, the C, or sometimes without. And so basically this is the way to reconcile all the different versions of your name and make sure that the work that is yours is always, contribute, is always attributed to you, not somebody else. Also, if there are people out there with exactly the same name as you, if you are Mike Smith, then it's also important to have an ORCID because that is an easy way to have a unique identifier that just basically lists your work and your contributions. And this ORCID stays with you, with you through your entire career. So also if you change institutions, your ORCID will stay the same. So that's basically a no-brainer, just get your ORCID. So this is what your ORCID page looks like. It displays your ORCID number here and then your name and you can also enter a short biography and um, also information about your past employment and qualifications and so on. So you can also make it kind of like also your own private little web page. The second recommendation is activate or use your Google Scholar page. Now, uh, put the link in there. Most of you will know this anyway, scholar.google.com. Now, why is it important to have this Google Scholar page? Simply because people are just more basically lazy, including myself, when you apply somewhere. The first thing people will do is they will Google you, right? I mean, this is probably what most everybody does. And so then if you have a Google Scholar profile, that will pop up. And then people can see what you have published, how your publication trajectory is developing through time, for example, how many times you are cited and what journals you typically publish in and all that just with one easy click. And so this is what I would say almost everybody will do. They will Google you and so therefore it's nice if you have claimed your Google Scholar profile. Now, how do you do that? So you go to the Google Scholar uh, website. Um, you use your institutional email address so that in the end you can have this verified um, tag to your profile. And after you, you claim your profile, you may have to do some curation to your profile because accidentally some bits and pieces or publications are attributed to you that are not yours or some papers just don't make any sense. And it's just very easy to go ahead and just delete them. So there's some minor curation after necessary, even though typically this works quite well. But make sure that you, you clean up your profile if there are errors in it. And then also make your profile public. And it helps if you add a picture 
of you so that there's a profile picture. And if you don't want to put a picture of yourself, put a picture of a flower or something, but it's nicer to have a picture there. Also, if you have a picture of you, it helps people identify you. Um, if, for example, there's somebody with a similar name, see what I talked about with the orchid. Yeah, and that's it. Basically, quick and simple. Just claim your Google Scholar profile and use it. Because even if you don't use it actively, if you don't link to it from your own website or in your email message tag, people will use it. People will search for it. And it's good if they find you. If you haven't seen a Google Scholar profile, this is what it can look like. So here it says that the email has been verified. So I used my institutional email to register here. It also has a link to my homepage. You can enter some search terms and then it lists your papers and also gives some uh, bibliometric details here. The third one is your own web page. I think it's important um, for you as a, especially as a young researcher, to have um, your own web page presence on the internet. Now you can usually just use your institutional template. I don't because the institutional, institutional template can uh, be not particularly user friendly and so I've always used like my own web page hoster. And it also has the advantage that if you move institutions, you don't have to start from scratch, but you can just move this web page with you. And this makes particularly a lot of sense if you're an early career researcher and you are prone to moving around initially, maybe, uh, then it's good to just have your own uh, website hosted with one of the very many uh, suppliers of web services. If you don't feel ambitious of using one of the many commercial um, options for building your own website, usually they have a free option, then you can just also piggyback of something that's already there. For example, your ORCID uh, website, you can add a lot of information about yourself there as well. So it actually can function as your own personal website. Or you can use your GitHub site if you have one uh, to also use it as your personal website if you don't want to develop something from one of the templates that are available. I personally have used a couple of different um, suppliers, most recently WordPress, I think is fine, but you can use just any other web service. And initially you can also use it for free. I've used it for free for most of my career, actually it worked fine. Also remember, it doesn't have to be super fancy. It should just be also just a, a consolidation of the links um, for you. For example, you can link to your org ID, you can use you link to your Google Scholar profile, um, you can deposit your CV, you can link your Twitter profile in there and whatever. So you have all of the things that are about you and your online presences basically all consolidated in one web page. I think it's very useful to do that uh, and you can also use that in applications. And this is really also what people use it generally for, it's just to tell you, tell people more about you. Uh, whatever you feel about <laughs> telling people about yourself. Maybe you have a picture gallery, maybe you don't. Uh, tell them about your research interests, about what you're currently working on, what are networking opportunities, uh, what you're looking for, whatever. Um, it can be any of this or just a selection of these and it can be as fancy as you like it to be. It can also be very simple as long as it does the job of just um, linking to all your various bits of online presence. Now there's of course very many other things you can do. You can go and establish a research gate profile, which is very useful for exchanging papers, for example, and manuscripts. You can go on YouTube, you can go on TikTok, you can be on Instagram and all of these things. But I think one thing that I recommend everybody in my lab to join is Twitter because um, I think it's just a very useful networking tool and a tool to get information. So most of the papers we discuss in our lab meetings every week we find on Twitter and um, we also tell other people about what we publish on Twitter and well we get lots of let's say input from Twitter and I find it therefore very useful. I use Twitter though only for uh, professional reasons. I don't use it for private reasons so if you also want to use Twitter for private reasons I, as I recommend establishing a separate account so you keep your timeline basically clean and uh, related to your science for the most part. And that's it. I think it's important to think about your online presence because this is how people will basically search for you when you apply someplace or when they want to find, find out more about you. For example, when they just read one of your papers. So I think it's worth 
spending some time um, thinking about what your online presence should be like. And I think if you have these four points considered, you're doing pretty well. And with that, thanks very much for watching and see you in the next video.